All right. All right. We're ready to start whenever you are. Sure. Uh, uh, do you want to say hi to um, uh, the David Vincent's family? I, I see Melissa and, and there may be some others. Hey. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We're uh, honored to have you here. I'm not sure who all, maybe Ann, you can say who all is here because I may not recognize names. Yeah, this is this is Marie, and my sister Melissa, I believe, is still is um, joined. My other sister Jessica was having some problems getting into the Zoom meeting, and it's kind of late for them. So, um, but I'm happy to hear that it's going to be recorded, and we can hopefully share that recording with them. And Joel and Patty, thank you very much for um, you know letting me know and including us. It's um, it means a lot. Thank you. Um. If you want to say anything about the early days when when uh, David was you know building the halls or or anything you know you can hop in. Um, I probably can't say too much or I'm going to start crying. But um, I spent a lot of time with my dad. Um, you know, just hanging out with him while he was mixing epox epoxy and working on the halls and. Um, a lot of really, really good memories, I think, for not just me, but for my other sisters as well. Um, I don't know, Melissa, if you're still on, um, if you want to jump in or not, but um, yeah, it, um, it, it means a lot to see the boat completed and um, like how much you are enjoying it and it's beautiful. So thank you. Yeah, um, I was also able to see some of the photographs that have been posted and Joel and Patty so graciously shared with us and we haven't had a chance to talk directly but got the messages passed through Anne-Marie and um, this boat was our dad's fourth daughter and other love of his life. And um, we got news of the boat being completed and the photographs uh, this year, the anniversary of his passing. So it just felt like a really wonderful uh, way to remember him this year. And we are very grateful. And it's really nice to be at one of these meetings. Again, it's been about 30 years. <laughs> so um, I see a few familiar faces, but um, yeah, thanks for including us tonight. We can't wait to hear more from Joel and Patty. And just one last thing really quick. I distinctly remember um, having a conversation with our family sitting around the dining room table talking about what we wanted to name the boat. And um, when I found out that it was named Manxi, that it started with an M, that really got to me because that was what we were thinking of. It had to have an M name to it. So the fact that it does is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to add that I talked to your mom and got to know her um, back in the past. And I remember she was quite a cat person. So I think, I don't know if she's still a cat person, but I think it's very appropriate that the, the boat's named after a cat. Well, there was one cat that she was a cat person about, right? But <laughs> But our father really wasn't about that cat. <laughs> Not about that, no. Well, thanks, thanks again for, for joining us all. Um, I'll start to share screen thing and then we can uh, work our way through some of the photos. So we're, we're just going to do a kind of a quick recap of kind of how we got yeah. here. Yeah. Here's Never, the boat. Okay. Hopefully. Um, so in the late fall of 2016, uh, we were, we wanted to make a major change by downsizing and living off the grid. And we were living and working in Edmonds, Washington for basically about 30 years with a beautiful townhouse uh, with a view. And so in the early winter of 2016, 
uh, Joel ran across an early YouTube video of uh, S. V. Delos and um, the guy named the guy from Washington State. His name is Brian. And we had no idea that people could wander the planet in their own home. So this inspired us so much that we joined the Puget Sound Cruising Club and the Northwest Multi Hall Association to find out more about cruising lifestyle and find other cruisers to take us on as crew. Um, and a special thanks to Martin and Linda Adams. Uh, so we could start gaining some experience and decide if we liked this idea. So a member uh, from the Northwest Multi Hall Association, Wayne Erickson, told us about this unfinished trimaran 35 John Marple's design uh, for the blue water sailing that we should take a look at. Um, the experienced boat builder David Vincent on Vashon Island, uh, Washington, that had started the project, sadly, you know, of course, we know he had passed away from cancer and a, a person who basically kind of salvaged and sort of found a home for uh, multi hulls, uh, Stephen Marco. Marco. Uh, he kind of basically um, had taken the boat, basically he took the boat down to Reno, Nevada. And so we actually flew down on May 10th of 2017 uh, to take a look at it in uh, Reno and just see what the condition and the level of completion was. Uh, the same year, we also made plans in June 2017 to go take our ASA courses through barefoot sailing in the Grenadines. So we were drawn to the multi holes. So we sailed a 38 lagoon for 10 days while studying for written testing and hands on sailing techniques. We were both in agreement that if either of us had a horrible experience, we would do something else. It took me a little longer to get my sea legs um, than Joel, but uh, that was one of the major concerns, but we both really liked it. So we made the uh, decision to purchase the unfinished trimaran and uh, in late August 2017, we brought it back to Washington State to a friend's property in Woodinville. And then we started working on her. So I'll let Joel kind of take it over from here. Yeah, so yeah, as Wayne mentioned, we can we can thank Wayne for introducing us to the boat. I had seen the boat for sale, but kept dismissing it as 35 foot trimaran seemed kind of small. And then he explained that John Marples had designed the thing specifically for a couple of the cross oceans. And so actually I got a hold of John and he sent us a study kit so we could at least see what the boat was about. And looked interesting enough that, as Patty said, we flew down to Reno to take a look at it and, and decided that that, uh, that could be our new home for the next few years. So we'll kind of start the, the journey of where we, we picked up with, um, I'll go back one. This is, this is uh, in front of Stephen Marco's house. This was actually been, been sitting in his driveway for a long time. And so I think his wife was happy to get the driveway back because a 35 foot boat takes up quite a bit of driveway and we loaded the amas and uh, mast on another trailer and then uh, we worked our way after we got everything loaded up then we worked our way north and uh, this is a shot of us actually just heading down into the columbia gourd working our working our way into washington state and then once we got it there, got things unloaded, and uh, then we could we could really assess to see what we've got. And so the the hall was functionally finished, but the the exterior wasn't fully finished. It actually had the bottom paint, the copper coat, which we're sitting in the water on now. And so it was mostly. Uh, just doing some finish work and then getting some coats at least of epoxy primer just to protect the hull until we could uh, we could better assess what was going on and winter was was quickly showing up in uh, the Seattle area anyway. So all the parts and pieces were were there and um, then we could just start to figure out what was going to be next. So we got the boat uh, under a, a tent and then uh, the Amas just had them stacked on some, some sawhorses and, uh, and then we could uh, start 
working on the exterior and then start thinking about working on the interior. Eventually, the we got the Amas put on some cradles that I built, and the, the cradles were actually helpful. I, I I got the cradles set up so that they would have the Amas sitting at the proper cant, and and then fore and aft, basically all axes. That once it was on a level ground, it would be set up so that it would make it easier for us to attach all the other parts and pieces once we got far enough along in the, in the project. The one hull at least had the most of the structure that the other one was just uh, a big, big canoe. So hopefully everybody's looking at the same screen as us. This is basically a blueprint of, of John's Constant Camber 35. I just wanted to give a quick look as to how the boat was laid out. If you're familiar with the Sea Runners, then this is similar, but John made so many great improvements to this design that uh, we, we really enjoyed it. So as with the other ones, it's got, it has a center cockpit and then the galley and, and uh, Cite was in the rear and then forward of the cockpit, you got into the, the sleeping area with a double bunk, which is quite comfortable on one side and then a, a single on the other. And then forward of that got into the, the vanity in the, the head. And for us, the boat was fit surprisingly well. So we were quite happy with it. So one of the first things that we wanted to do uh, before we got too far along in the exterior is we wanted to increase the size of the windows just a little bit, probably 15 or 20% just to improve the view when we were sitting sitting in the boat. And so that was, um, that was a pretty substantial project. We uh, opened, opened up the, the windows and then as Jeff Oakley told us on his boat, if you can actually get the surfaces flat, then you can just bond on the, the windows and wouldn't have to put all the, the screws in. And so with a fair amount of effort, we have, we have managed to make the sides flat where the windows going to attach. And we didn't fully appreciate how curvy John's boat was until we tried to make a flat spot on it. But we spent quite a bit of time that summer making them flat. And uh, it helped actually helped to reinforce the, the window frames where we had taken things out. So then we we're able to just use the high bonds tape on on acrylic cast acrylic windows, and we were able to get everything put into place. And so far, so good. They they've actually worked really well for us. We um, we enjoy the view and uh, and have enjoyed having fewer holes in the boat. If we ever have any issues, we know we can add some holes, but it was nice to not have to start out with any, any holes in the boat. So that was a, a good chunk of the summer. And then we realized we needed to start working on the interior because it was gonna work out that while we were in a friend's property in Woodenville, we could get the interior done, make it livable before we would have to take it somewhere to actually put the three pieces together. And so, you can kind of see the condition that we had. The interior, the workmanship that David had done was fantastic. We just needed to go through, reseal everything up and then start building the interior to, to what we wanted. And so we wanted to have a, a cantilever table so we gave a little more foot room. And so I, I welded up an aluminum uh, frame for it that we could slide the, the table in and out. And also uh, we wanted to remove it if we wanted to turn it into a bed, that would be a pretty easy thing to do. But then over with a lot of effort and a lot of petty sewing skills and, and taste, we were able to turn it into to something that uh, now we call home is where we're, we're sitting right now. And then it was kind of the same condition for the galley. It was, everything was roughed in structurally, but we, it was obviously gonna need a lot of work to turn it into a, a functioning galley. And so now we've got uh, quite a comfortable home with uh, nice countertops and, and uh, quite a bit of cabinetry. And uh, that's worked out really well for, for us to date. We've got on one side, it's just cabinetry. And then on the other side, um, we have the sink and actually we, we have uh, all electric boat. And so it, it has electric appliances instead of propane appliances. And so actually one of the drawers, which I think I've got a slide up later, you'll actually be able to see that we just have the, the stove in a drawer and this induction stove top has worked out great for us. Then moving forward of the cockpit, we can quickly get into the, uh, the forward cabin with the sleeping area in the hot, kind of the condition that we received it in. And then um, we still have some more cosmetic work to do, but functionally we have a very comfortable bedroom now that uh, underneath 
the double bunk is actually space for water tanks. So we have a, a 27 gallon, actually it's a 42 gallon water bladder under there. And then at the, at the aft end and then the forward end, we actually turn that into the electrical closets. There's actually five uh, hundred amp lithium phosphate batteries that we shoehorned in there along with a 3000 watt inverter and, and three solar controllers. So we used up every bit of volume that was safe to use under that bed. And then in the uh, moving forward in the vanity area, it, uh, it actually still had the sink that planned on going in there, but we decided we would upgrade that a little bit. And uh, you can see a lot of Patty's handiwork there. If everybody's caught up with the slides of a little glass basin and uh, we have this nice wall covering that they use on high-end yachts and hotels that we've used to start to finish the, the walls. And then uh, some of Patty's artwork on the, on the floor of this vanity also doubles as our, as our shower. And so the holes there are where the drain goes through with a little pump to pump it out. And wherever we could, we tried to highlight David's beautiful work. So if there was a wall that we didn't have to put something on, we just clear coated it just to show off the, the beautiful workmanship that he'd done. And if anybody has questions along the way, because it'll probably be difficult to go back to, please don't hesitate to, to jump in. We're happy to answer questions as we go. Just showing how we transform the uh, the head area from start to finish. And we now we have a, a simple composting head up front, which has served us extremely well. And about the only modification that we made to the whole boat was the in the vanity, we lowered the floor just so that thankfully we're only five foot eight, and so we didn't have to lower a lot so that we could have standing headroom in the vanity in the, in the shower area. Otherwise, we didn't have to really touch any of his workmanship all the way through the interior. It was amazing the level of detail everywhere that we looked in the boat and really, I think as I had mentioned to, to Anne Marie, is it helped us raise the bar and our workmanship just to try and match what, what David had done on the boat. And so the, the real construction from my standpoint happened uh, outside the main hall that uh, we decided to put full wings on the boat and so it was all uh, akumi plywood and, and mahogany structure john marples was kind enough to send us a full set of plans so that i didn't have to invent anything and mess anything up and so you, we didn't really have a, a legitimate workshop so it was just two pop-up tents and uh i was able to put drill press and everything i needed in there to start building building a boat and so uh, once we got the one side finished, then we were able to match it up with the with the AMA and get that bonded in place. And then the second AMA was actually a little bit more work than the first. We had more structure to build, but at least I had had some practice. And so that AMA started out as really just a, an empty canoe that we had to put out, build all the structure. But thankfully, all the we had all the templates from John and and to my surprise, after all the years I was sitting around, I didn't have to convince those, those side walls to change shape very much, that, that everything slid in there pretty nicely. And then after that, it was, it was starting to close out structure. So we, with enough clamps, we convinced the, the plywood to take the shape over the, to cap off the amas. And uh, at this point, we were actually able to use our friend's shop he just did a big remodel on it, but it was far enough finished that then we could start to move some parts and pieces indoors where we had a level floor that we could actually start to assemble pieces. The, the big thing for us was to try and get the AMAs installed in line as the drawing showed with the main hall. And so we, the, the strategy for us was to use these big stainless steel plates that we, we attached to complete the, the major beams forward and aft. And so we were able to just use those with a couple of pilot holes just to locate everything when we knew we were in a controlled situation. So then when we moved the boat, it would be easier to get everything back into alignment again. 
So this is where everybody got to come out for open house. This was in November of 2019, I guess. They got to see the state of the boat before we started heading south. And we ended up taking three trailer loads to Napa Valley Marina, where they had a nice boat yard that we could work on the boat for a year. And they were one of the few places on the West Coast that could handle multi hulls. And so that was a perfect home for us, getting the boat on a trailer and then, and then driving south, which was uh, exciting and nervous all at the same time. But uh, the, the boat trailered just fine. It was a little faster going down the Pacific coast on I-5 than it was going down the Pacific. So we got down there in just a couple of days. But it was, uh, once we got it uh, down there, then we had to offload the first round and then go back for more. So I think I'm waiting for a slide to catch up. This is uh, in the marina, using their carrier to, to, to get it in place. And uh, it was a good yard. We had a pasture behind the boat where we got to watch cows for over a year and uh, got to watch new cows born and cows go. And once we got, they got the boat that just the main hall settled, everybody was a little confused in the boatyard what kind of a boat this was because it didn't have a keel and it just didn't look right. It wasn't a power boat. But uh, after we got the rest of the pieces down there, then it started to make a little bit more sense to everybody. So we went back to Seattle and picked up the Amas, got those loaded on a trailer, and started heading south two more times to get all the parts and pieces in our entire life in, uh, in or on the boat to get it down there. So once we get it down there, it was pretty easy for them to lift the Yamas in place and uh, then allowed us to start to get things lined up so we could, for the first time, actually start to see it as a trimaran before we had never seen more than one side on at a time. And so the, to tie the, the forward and aft beams together, we use these big stainless steel plates to tie them together, plate on either side so we could have everything tied back in, in double shear with a lot of half inch bolts it did analysis six different ways to see what it was what would be strong enough because we really wanted those almonds to stay connected to the boat but uh, we've been out playing in the ocean and gotten beat up pretty good in san francisco bay and and the boat seems quite stout so we're happy so then it was starting to build the the final structure now that we had three halls all hooked together and um, that continued really kind of through the winter, we had a very dry winter in Napa, which wasn't good for California, but it was it was good for us in our production. And so we were able to keep powering through building the, the Ford Akas. And then starting to get the, the sheeting on all of those. We had already built all the, the hatches for the Amas and then the boat started to start to really look like closer to a, a trimaran instead of just pieces of a boat. We used Kiwi Grip on all the decks. So it's been really nice stuff to work with, easy to repair, and it's given us a nice surface. One of the things that uh, as we were talking about earlier in the meeting that we wanted to have uh, a fully enclosed cockpit. When I was talking to people, they either said that it was either two, you were either trying to stay out of the cold or you were trying to hide from the sun. And so we decided we would just really turn it into a, a proper room. And uh, so we built a foam core roof. It was about eight feet by eight feet. And uh, thanks to Bill Quigley, who donated a lot of Kevlar, we were able to build quite a substantial structure. It only weighed about 50 pounds when it was completed. And uh, it's kept us dry and kept us comfortable. We've been thankful to have it sailing in the bay. When it's 50 degrees out, we're just tucked in there nicely. And we're coming back. We did a trip down the coast to Half Moon Bay last week. And it was 45 degrees coming back, but it was probably 65 degrees in the cockpit. And we were just in, enjoying the view. So we've been happy to have it. And hopefully it'll serve us well when we get to warmer climates. But we have installed tempered glass for the for the front because we really wanted to be able to see through it with opening windows and then we learned how to sew and thanks to sail videos we're able to do the complete 
enclosure for for the rest of it, which is served as well through cold weather and warm weather and rain and wind and everything else. And eventually we'll probably be able to remove a bunch of it once we get to a warmer climate and we'll swap them out for bug screens. And we rented a little shop space at Napa Marita where Patty could turn it into a bit of a sail loft. And uh, we did a whole lot of sewing and uh, learned, learned a bunch that that sail rate machine can really power through things. Once we get it all put together, we the, the roof has kind of a grab rail built all the way around it. The gutters work pretty well for rain catchment system. And it was a great place to get uh, 270 watt solar panels. And then uh, the next thing we needed to build was a refrigerator. And so this wasn't the most high tech fridge, but we needed it to fit the space we had. And so I just went to Lowe's and bought some RMAX two inch thick foam, which had, uh, I think, an R rating. Uh, of I think it's like 13 or something, which probably could be better, but it was good enough. I didn't want to give up any more volume. The, the space has only allowed us to have about a three and a half cubic foot fridge, which for Patty and I is, is actually worked out really well. It, and so it has a little isotherm cooling unit that's water cooled for it. It's pretty energy efficient and pretty quiet. It's served us well. It's not often that we get to see the bottom of the fridge, but we know it's time to go shopping when we see it again. And then for power for the boat, we bought a, the boat I think originally had a, maybe a 25 horse Yanmar that Steve and Marco had taken out to sell. And so then we swapped it out for a new beta 25 horse, which is a bit overkill for the boat. I apologize, John, for putting such a big motor in it. But the irony is he had this beautiful auto prop in the back that we ended up having to, we, we liked the prop so much that we matched the engine to the size of the prop. And, it, uh, other than adding a little bit of weight, uh, the fuel consumption seemed to be about the same. I think we've, we've averaged burning about a, a third of a gallon an hour at about seven knots. And so um, that's worked out really well for, for us. And so the, the trick was to slide it in. We, we were trying to avoid having to cut a hole in the cockpit because the engine room is below the cockpit. And so it turned out that we could just slide it in bring it into the fore cabin and just slide it through the, the opening, the forward opening in the engine room and, and slide it into place. And it, I mean, it just fit. We may have scraped a little bit of the red paint as I was sliding it through. But it tucked nicely into the engine room. It turned out that the mounts that uh, David had put in almost perfectly matched up with the beta needed. And so we were able to slide the engine in there. We've got a 27 gallon fuel tank that sits in there as well as uh, the high pressure pump actually for our small water maker is all in there. And so we've taken full advantage of all the volume that was that was in that engine room and have tried to give it plenty of ventilation to, uh, to make it happy in there. But so far it's purred like a kitten and it's, it's got us around when, the, when there was no wind. Uh, we it's, it's treated us really well. And so with all the engine controls we, uh, we have in the cockpit and uh, it's made for the ergonomics of this whole setup has actually been really good. We've, we haven't had any issues as far as reaching things. You'll see later that uh, we actually borrowed the same steering system that Paul has on his boat with the remote tiller system and we've, we've really enjoyed it so far. So then the next major project for us was installing the, the mast. So we got the, the mast step set up and when we we received what came with the boat david I, I can't imagine the amount of work he put into the custom mast custom boom four sets of sails and so but it was still just kind of an empty stick when we got it and so we had to set it up with all the the halyards and all of the the rigging we decided to go with synthetic rigging and so we had them raise the mast and then we uh like a lot of multi hulls these days we set it up with synthetic rigging using some of the, the Caligo end fittings and some SK78 Dyneema that um, had a little bit of stretch in the beginning, but it seems quite happy now. And we, we've enjoyed the simplicity of it. It solved one of the problems that I didn't really know how long the stays were gonna be. And so we could be off by a foot and still have the, the links proper. And so, Patty sweated for a few days doing all of the 
the ends for the the ropes and now we've got spare spare stays just in a in a little bag so we're, we should be set for the foreseeable future it's a, it, that stuff is really nice to work with going up the mast for the first time just to make sure everything looked okay it was actually a good view of showing all the we've got 670 watt solar panels and uh that provides all the power that we need to to live off grid we we yeah, we really haven't needed any more power. In fact, usually we've got the batteries fully topped off by noon or, or one o'clock, and that's with all electric appliances. Then the next uh, project we tackled was the putting the nets on, and I wrestled the best way to do that. I was really trying to minimize the number of holes we had to put in the boat, and so we settled on using uh, just a few large reinforced holes and then some stainless steel tubing around the perimeter of the Dyneema netting so that then uh, we didn't have to put as many holes in the boat and it gave really even tension on the on the nets. We've been really happy with it. I'm looking forward to watching dolphins or staring at the, the stars at night from that. And then uh, one other thing that we actually borrowed an idea from another, it was actually just a computer rendering I think I saw of a, another trimaran that they they put a little bit of lacing up front just to make it feel a little more secure when we're up at the bow so that it didn't look like you were going to fall off the, the boat. And that's, it's comforting. I don't know how useful it is, but it, it feels good to have it up there. It helps a lot. This is actually a shot of us in the marina where we're, we're at now. And then uh, we did, decided, we thought we might need some, we would, if we we're going to be Doing a circumnavigation is a lot of downwind sailing and so I thought maybe a, a short bow sprit would be useful for a code zero or a spinnaker and so I ended up just building something out of a large aluminum box section that just kind of matched the properties of a telescoping bow sprit and uh, easily removable I don't know that we will I only brought it out enough just so that the the sail would, would clear the bow pulpit and didn't need to go any further than that and so we we actually did get a chance to fly a spinnaker the other day and it worked well for that and now we're actually getting quotes to to build a, a code zero or a, a screecher it feels like we could use a little bit more sail area when we've got really light winds the the bay has been interesting that you either have not enough wind or way too much wind and so it's been good for us to test all the all the different systems and see what we think we need okay. we've got a 35 pound Mantis II anchor to try and keep us attached to, to, to the ground. And that so far has treated us pretty well. We decided to pull the anchor locker back all the way to the, the forward aka just to pull that weight further back. And so I think that's just actually a suggestion of, of John Marples too, to run the chain through a split piece of PVC pipe just to keep the deck clean. And that's actually worked out really well. I mean, we've seen plenty of mud in the bay and it's amazing how well that's kept the decks pretty clean. And it's been nice to have the, the chain pulled back a little bit into this space that we didn't have a lot of good use for. And um, so far it's been treating us really well. We've got uh, 180 feet of, of quarter inch high tensile, high tense chain and then another 180 feet of half inch rope so hopefully that will treat us well as we anchor out in in foreign lands the original jib that came with the boat the lapper sail it was actually a set up for hank on system and we wanted to have a furler system and so we sewed on a, a luff tape on the front of that and then sewed the sacrificial cover around the end so we just set up the sail right sewing machine underneath the underneath the boat and turn it into a bit of a sail loft so that we could uh, start to get the, the sail hardware ready to go. And then the next piece of big sail structure was a, a stack pack, which has actually turned out so great for us that that drops into the bag every time. That previous picture shows the copper coat on the bottom of the comma. Uh, So the last uh, bit we had to do really was just a little bit of uh, painting, bottom paint. We had to paint the amas and uh, just to, we just were going to match the copper coat that David had put on the, the boat years ago. And so we, we ordered some copper coat to 
uh, matchup where it was on the bottom. And uh, then we were really just a matter of finishing up the sail handling gear and we were gonna be ready to go in the, in the water. But the, the sail that he had built for the boat was a beautiful main, powerful mainsail, fully battened, which we really enjoyed. The boat set up with three reef points. We were using a double line reefing system and we ran all the lines back to the cockpit just so that um, we could try and keep ourselves out of harm's way. And when I was laying it out, I thought it was gonna be really busy, but it's turned out to actually work out pretty well. We've got four halyards with these constrictor type clutches up on the mast, which have worked out well. And the cool thing about these constrictor clutches is that you can actually run the release line remotely. So we can actually release the main halyard from the cockpit if, we're, if we need to reef the sails. So we've got everything nicely color coded for us rookie sailors to try and figure out what rope goes where. But so far we've, I guess we've only double reefed so far is all we've had to do on, on one extremely gusty day in the bay. And um, that, that system has, has worked out really well for us. We, we had some of the, actually three of the winches came with the boat with one to spare that we, that we got the bill. And so um, we purchased a three more winches to handle the, the head sails and the, the main sheet that those sit in the aft end of the, the cockpit. And the whole system has worked out really well. It's, it's simple to, to uh, work the sails. It's a little bit, um, it can get a little bit busy with both of us, but we've sort of have got the dance figured out as far as tacking and flipping from one side to the other like everybody else has to do. But um, we decided as mentioned to go with this remote tiller system and it's, we mostly just copied what Paul did on, on what Paul has on his boat. And it's, it's actually worked really nice. It simplifies some things for us. It op completely opened up the cockpit. We were used to tiller steering on, on all of the ferrier boats and made for a easy autopilot setup. We've got a pelagic autopilot tiller pilot system, which seems really bulletproof and um, it's easy to get spare parts for it. And so we were gaining quite a bit of confidence with the, with the autopilot system. And about the only change we're gonna make to our steering system is I had originally used some Dyneema rope for the control lines, which had plenty of strength, but there was a bit of stretch in the beginning, which we knew would happen, but it still feels just a little bit spongy at times. And that's just not, it's not a great feeling when we're working it pretty hard. And so in a couple of weeks, we're going to swap it out for going back to stainless steel cable as it's probably should have had in the, in the beginning. Otherwise, we've been really happy with the way the system has worked. Uh, the, the basic rudder system and the, the kick up center board that John designed, that's, it's just so robust and gives us complete confidence when we're out, out sailing, big skag in the front and still plenty of, of control when we need it. And then uh, the last bit that we had to do was working on our, our center board. And uh, I think the next slide will, will show that once it, it shows up. So we get the, the center board installed and copper coated. And then it was mostly just setting up the control lines for the, uh, for the center board, which uh, has actually worked out really well for us. The next slide will show the center board trunk. I'm not sure where everybody else is at. We've got a remote screen just trying to see if, where we're at in this. And so you can sort of, we, we actually put a clear Lexan cover over the centerboard trunk so that we could see what the ropes were doing and maybe see fish swim by at some point. But uh, it was a little bit spooky the first time we put in the water, the, the boat in the water, and then suddenly you could see water inside the boat. Thankfully it was, looked like an aquarium, but it's taken a little while to get used to being able to see water when you're sitting inside your boat. But the system has worked well. It's, uh, it was 
Paul had warned us that it's not hard to bring the board up. It's hard to get it down. There's so much buoyancy in that center board that I, we actually put a two to one system on the purchase on it just so that we make it easier to, to pull the, uh, the center board down with all that buoyancy. So that had, that had pretty much all the functional part of the boat put together. And so then Patty was able to work her graphics magic to come up with a, uh, the logo for the boat, which employed a lot of elements that she, she likes a lot. So the name of the boat actually came from um, my mom's um, cattery. She had a cattery called Sands Q Manxy and um, she had several Manx cats and she actually had given us several of them. And on my 42nd birthday, one of her last litters before she shut down her cattery, um, she gave us, um, she gave me a cat for my birthday. And so her name was Bajula and everybody called her Miss B. But um, she moved with us onto the boat in Woodenville, Washington, which was a right up against a green belt and lots of wildlife, including coyotes. But she had always been an indoor outdoor cat and uh, keeping her on the boat was pretty uh, challenging. So one night we just could, didn't bring her in early enough, unfortunately, and a coyote got her. So anyway, so Manxie came from my mom's cattery and our mascot was the Manx cat, um, which, uh, uh, Anyways, we're, partly because we were looking for kind of a short and different and a catchy name, um, we had decided to wait to get another Manx cat right now just because um, it's really hard to travel with an animal on board and many countries won't let you come in with an animal on board. So plus the paperwork and shots and the list goes on and on to make it hard to travel. So anyways, um, I got a animatronics kitty for now. Um, our second mascot, her name is Manxie. <laughs> so this is probably way, way more than you need to know, but that's kind of how the name came about. Yeah, and Manxie, it was nice. It was, it was easy to pronounce and easy to spell if we need to. And so it's, um, it's worked out well for us and we're happy to, to have little Kitty along with us. Just going to talk a little bit about the systems on the boat and we were trying to keep as many systems simple as we could and so our plumbing system thankfully it just entails two foot pumps about eight feet of, of tubing going to that 40 gallon rubber bladder and so thankfully the the plumbing system on the boat was quite simple and robust and then our because we knew that the electrical system was gonna be a bit more complex. We were trying to keep the boat as simple as possible. Our, it's funny, our evolution as we learn more about boats in the beginning, we wanted, like everybody else, rookie sailors wanted all the fancy stuff. And then the more we thought about how things could break and the more we listened to Jim Brown and John Marples, simple was better. And so we tried to, to simplify things as much as we could. So now our, our hot water system is a electric tea kettle and that, uh, that has served us well if we need to, to make hot water or, or take a shower. We have a simple pump-up shower. We've got a 360-degree shower curtain that we can put in the vanity. And um, that's we through all of COVID, we decided we would just shower on our boat. And so the system has actually worked out quite well for us. So we didn't need anything more, more complicated than, than that. It's easy to pop in and out. Do you have a, a salt water system on board? Do you have uh, salt water for, for yes. us? Yeah, we we don't. Oh. Something we could add. We we have a we have a water maker, but what we've found is, at least for Patty and I, for almost two years we've been on the boat. We consistently use five gallons of fresh water a day, and we that's without trying to conserve anything. And so we probably could easily drop that in half if we needed to. And so, so, so far we, we haven't, although it would be easy for us to add it if for some reason we decided that it was needed. And so it, it simplified our plumbing, but it, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see long-term if, if we need it or not. The, the idea for us was with the rain catchment system and we don't have a lot of water on board, but we, we have some jerry cans that we can fill if we're gonna do a long offshore passage to not have to rely on the water maker. The water maker we have is a simple, super simple, robust 
system, but I know at some point it's going to fail when we don't want it to. And so then we'll, uh, we'll have to think about whether salt water would be a handy thing to have on the boat. We know we can, we can add it pretty quickly if, if needed. The main yeah, uh, most cruisers use uh, salt water for washing and, and you can even use it for cooking um, vegetables and things. You just use half salt and half fresh and you can really cut your freshwater usage down to very little. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to find out how, how that plays out over, over time when we're further away from easy sources of fresh water. I think the main reason why we kind of decided to maybe try and see if we can get along without having a salt water piece to this system was that it's really corrosive um, to just the sink and all of the plumbing. Um, the salt is, is extremely um, corrosive in a lot of ways. So that was one of the reasons also is trying to uh, bring down some of that corrosion issue. Time will tell. We just used, um, we used to pick up salt um, water coming up the coast in a bucket and put it in the sink just to walk for the initial washing the dishes and then we uh, rinsed it with the fresh water and that worked fine because we, we only did that out in the ocean because I mean that's the only place we've been where it's really clean enough. Yeah that makes sense too. Yeah a lot of the water that's around here uh, is not that clean <laughs> especially in Napa Valley it was definitely very murky. There's a lot of, lot of well water. But our electrical system, that was an area that, for better or worse, that was going to be a more complex system just because we were trying to not put propane in the boat just because we'd heard it was could be complicated to get propane in certain parts of the world. And if that was a complete system we could avoid, we thought we'd try it, particularly with solar getting so good and lithium batteries being so robust that um, it seemed like it was something to try. And now... Boy, every cruiser boat we know, if they don't have the system we have, they're they're putting it on uh, at the same time. Because we'll find out how durable it is. But everybody is switching to electric everything with induction stove tops just to to simplify simplify life. We'll have a backup alcohol stove, and we may get a propane grill just so we can grill and then use that as a backup system if we need it. But our our system employs uh, we've got a little over a thousand watts of solar, it, which at any one given time, there's probably about 600 watts that's available to us. It's not shadowed by a mast or, or something else. And then we have a, a 3000 watt inverter that's powered by five 100 amp lithium phosphate batteries. And that, the system for us for the last year and a half has been pretty robust. We've tried to basically live off the grid, grid even when we were in the boatyard just to test the systems and it's worked out pretty well. We, we had custom panels made for us and our lighting system, uh, we ended up using LED strip lights, actually the little outlet you can see there's a, a, a dimmer switch and then we actually have, we can switch it from white to red uh, lights. We, we bought some, a little channel section for the LEDs to go into that actually was wide enough that we could put in white lights and red lights. So all throughout the boat, we can switch, we can dim the lights and then switch from, from white to red if we need to. And it's just amazing how little energy LED lights use. And so that's been pretty robust for us. And then as I mentioned earlier, we just have a little single induction cooktop burner that we bought from Amazon three years ago. We actually used this in our house for a year just to see if we could live with it. And we just can't kill the thing. We actually have another one sitting in a box because it's only cost $60. And then we knew it would fit the drawer, but we use this thing three times a day and it uh, doesn't use very much power, quite efficient. And we never have gotten over the novelty of as soon as you pull a pot off the stove, you can just shut the drawer because there's, you can literally just put your hand on the, that little cover as soon as you pull it off. It just doesn't create heat, it's, which is, should be nice when we get in warmer climates. One other little piece of technology that I, I picked up, which has worked out well for us, is now you can start to buy, it's just a large Kindle of just a big e-reader. This one was made by this company called Books, B-O-O-X. It's a 10.3 inch screen that's um, e-ink technology, so you can use it in full daylight. And it's for us, it's worked out great as an instrument. So we've got a complete NEMA 2000 network on board, wireless network. And so this just 
we just stream it to this because this has an Android operating system, you can download all the normal navigation apps. It's not great for a chart plotter because the refresh rate on these e-readers isn't very good, but for just instruments, it's really robust. It's, it, it was fairly cheap, like 400 bucks to buy it for a 10 inch screen. It, it doesn't really use hardly any electricity. And like I said, you can see it in full daylight. And so that's worked out really well for us. We, um, We've also, we're still kind of debating on what to use for the real navigation system um, where we've tried a, a variety of different software and we're going to continue to play around with it. But it is one of the things with the electronic stuff, it changes by the day. And so we just keep seeing what, what else is available. The dinghy was a big question mark for us. We were trying to get something that was as light as possible because we knew the boat was getting heavier with our fully enclosed cockpit and doing the full wings as opposed to having nets uh, and so, but we wanted something, everybody says that your dinghy is your car. And so we actually decided on this uh, catamaran style dinghy made by Ducks, a little company in, in Michigan. Made a really nice boat. It's, it's fairly lightweight for its volume. And the nice thing is you can pop out the floor and you can completely deflate it. So if we're going to do a real passage, I think we can, we can take it, deflate it and put it away and uh, then have a 9.8 horsepower engine for it. And so it's it's not the lightest setup, but it, it hopefully it'll serve us well to get us around as we get further away from home. And um, we bought some wheels for it. So it's pretty easy for me to, to pull it around and we've gotten a chance to try it out in a, a few different locations now. And so as we get older, hopefully we can still drag this thing off, off out of the water and onto the beach. And you drag it up on 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 board at night. Yeah, exactly. We we've been able to use a halyard just to to pull it up on deck, and that's worked out pretty well. It fits the space really well, and it we kind of pin it between the halyards. I mean, between the stays, and so it doesn't seem to want to go anywhere. We'll have to rope it down a little more when we really get out there. But so far, it's treated us pretty well. Yeah, have you you'll, thought of you'll, making... you'll be in some places where that boat will be very, very attractive for thieves. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. You'll have to bring it on board every night. Yeah. For for sure. Yeah. And it, the novelty for us right now is if if we're in a, a comfortable place that you can just slide the slide the dinghy between the hulls and it's 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 a perfect carport for it. And so <laughs> pretty invisible. You actually can't tell it's even there. Something yeah. that something that we learned from Bill Quigley using that is his, his power plant when we were moving the boat around. And so that that's <laughs> it makes it really convenient to get it out. Just step out on the, the swim platform and step into the dinghy. And so we've we've really enjoyed that, whether it was by good luck or planning, John, it's it's worked out great. Have you thought of making a cover for it? Yeah, we thought about it a lot. So that's that's sort of one of the last sewing projects to try and protect it from the UV. Living in Seattle for 30 years, UV wasn't such a big word, but living in Napa for a year and a half, we learned about uh, what UV, what UV really, what the sun can really do to things. Get some ratty old uh, umbrella that somebody discarding a boat cover and make your cover out of that so it's not attractive. Yeah, exactly. And, and do the same thing for the engine cover to make it look as unattractive as, as possible. So we just have a, a few more slides just showing us going in the water. But if if um, if there's questions, I don't know how people are doing for time, especially John. It's getting it's getting late. We can kind of go through these last few slides just showing us in the water, and then we we're happy to continue the conversation for as as long as people want, but want to try and respect everybody's time. So this um this was a big day for us, as you would guess, where. We uh, had them bring their, their nifty trailer in to raise the boat up and slide us into the water. And for all the work that we did, it was amazing how uneventful it was to uh, be on land. For me, it would be on land for 56 years and then 20 minutes later, being a water-based human was, uh, was pretty cool. But if anybody needs to haul out in the West Coast, Napa Valley Marina is a it's a great place to work. The people there were super nice, just left us alone, let us work for a year. And um, 
they were they actually have a pretty nice channel there and the working conditions are great it's it's dry it's it's not super warm in the winter but it's epoxy will still cure and that was the criteria for us originally we planned on finishing the boat in port townsend but we just didn't see how we were going to make epoxy cure epoxy cure in the winter time but in napa sometimes we had to use the fast hardener but everything always cured overnight and allowed us to keep the project going so since we got in the water we uh, spent a, a few i think another couple of weeks in napa just trying to get our life in order and get everything we owned on our boat and then worked our way into San Francisco Bay. And since then we've we've been on a guest dock in uh, Richmond at Marina Bay Yacht Harbor, just basically right on San Francisco Bay. And that's actually worked out really well for us. It's, um, it's a, we're in a pretty easy slip to get in and out of, which was helpful for two people who hadn't, didn't have a lot of experience on multi-hulls and uh, it's quick access to the bay and then in the bay, you can get whatever you want on any given day. And in wintertime, it's a little bit flukier, but we're already starting to get into more consistent afternoon winds. And um, so we can we can go out and get beat up if we need to, or if we need to hide somewhere, it's, it's easy to just to hide behind Angel Island or wherever we want. So we've been trying to sail two or three days a week to kind of get through this steep learning curve and anchor out at least once a week. And so we've been here, I guess, for about Five or six weeks now and we you know we've sailed quite a bit in a variety of circumstances and then last i guess a week ago exactly we got the courage to sail underneath the golden gate bridge and head down to half moon bay for a couple of nights and that was a really great experience for us we waited until it was really easy weather just so that we wouldn't uh, get beat up too much on our first ocean adventure but it was an easy sail down there and we had a, a couple of beautiful nights in a nice protected anchorage and then came back up. And so now we're, we're getting much closer to uh, being ready to start heading down the coast. The last thing we're gonna do, we're gonna be here for a couple more weeks and then we're actually gonna go back up to the Napa Marina and get hauled out just to take a look at the underside of the boat. The boat had never been in the water before in the main hall, we really didn't do anything to it. And so I was, I just wanted to make sure that there weren't any surprises of water trying to find its way underneath the copper coat so we could address that and we really didn't know where the water line was going to show up was really going to be and so we got in the water and it, it did as it turned out the boat perfectly the, the bottom paint perfectly matches the water line so the the boat it floats completely level relative to it but we would like to raise the water line up a couple of inches while we've got easy access to it. it. It was sort of an excuse to pull the boat out of the water and we're gonna raise the water line a couple inches just so that we're, we're not trying to grow stuff on the, on the side of the boat. But uh, otherwise, there really isn't a lot left to do. So we, um, we actually were gonna hang around the bay until we could get COVID shots and it just worked out that um, the county we're in, they got some extra vaccines. And so Patty and I are both in our 50s, but we were able to get our first shot a week ago and so we'll be able to get our second round at the end of the month and then I think we're going to start to run out of reasons to not head south. Our goal from the beginning is trying to get to a warmer climate and so the plan is to get down into the Sea of Cortez and then just sort of figure it out from there to be honest. We got to wait for the world to open up but there's plenty of areas that we can explore down there and so we're just going to get down there and and figure out what to do during hurricane season whether we just stay in the Sea of Cortez and be careful or head further south. We we don't know yet. We're just kind of taking it a bit at a time, but we're confident that we can work our way down the coast and get down into to Baja and, and then figure it out from there. You really need to get that waterline up um, because otherwise the, <clears throat> your topside paint next to the waterline will get really dirty and it'll look, it'll look really weird. Yeah, we're we're gonna probably raise the waterline up almost about I, I think more like four inches. So, cause it's right, like the water line is right where the copper cone basically kind of ends. And it's obviously you can kind of almost see on in this picture, the scum line or sort of the, you know, kind of dirty, uh, whatever sticks to the boat has already gotten up on the white part of the uh, boat. So we definitely got to raise that water line up uh, several inches. Joel, what's your clearance to the wig? The, the, say that one more time. I didn't quite hear you. Clearance. What's your clearance from the water top to the wing? 
Yeah, I think it's it's about a little less than three feet. I should probably know, but I, I don't know exactly to have be honest. Been, and I, one of my questions: Have you been out in the you know some big chop? Does it slap? Are you getting? You know, we haven't had any slap. slap? Yeah, we've we've no. we've been in some really nasty short, you know, classic bay stuff, short and steep stuff that we haven't. When we went out, when we were out in the ocean last week. It was it was super benign conditions. I mean, it was reasonably big swell, but a long period in between, and then there wasn't enough wind that there was a lot of chop out there. Although coming back under the gate, it was as you would guess, going out and come back in, it was a bit sloppy. But but no, I mean, there, John could probably address this better than us. But I mean, there's so much nice volume in the forward end of the Amas that if the the bow just doesn't want to go down very deep, and so so far so good. I mean, John probably could answer better, or Paul, but. Yeah, John, is that thing gonna, do you have to worry about like on a, you know, on a catamaran, you know, getting that big slap, you know, in between? We haven't had any problems with that yet. Yeah, you can, you can drive the armor right down to the water where the deck is right down on the water if you want. The, the leading edge of the, of the underwing is a, is a down facing angle. You can see how the deck is sloped down mm -hmm. to the underwing rather than the underwing sweeping up to the deck. And so, it cuts the tops of the waves off, and it stops a lot of that pounding uh, that you, that is is normal with other boats, and as, as you know, like sea runners and so forth have pounding problems because most of them are overloaded. But it's a uh, it's all, always a question of you know loading. But um, this this boat um, the 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 whole crossbeam Aka section enters the AMA hull through the deck and not through the AMA top side. So it's got quite a bit of clearance out there. Mm -hmm. Cool. I never had trouble um, with burying the bow coming up the coast and even to 12 foot seas. Um, and the uh, <clears throat> AMAs would, would basically usually, first third was sort of like punch into a, a, a swell and then they, they just go right through. Uh, it, it's a beautiful sea boat, absolutely beautiful sea boat. The only time, time, time I ever had water coming over the bow was actually in Puget Sound off Seattle. And it was from the wake of a, um, a container ship, um, which had turned right sort of in front of me and kicked up a huge, extremely sh uh, steep and short um, uh, sea. And that actually did go right over the bow into my open hatch. <laughs> <laughs> but the, now the ocean never, never did that. Yeah, the only time we buried one of the Amas a little bit was when we came under the 580 bridge, the yeah. wind went from like about, I don't know, it was like maybe 12 knots up to um, 25 to 27 knots. It like just jumped super high. And then the water also just the sea state changed a whole lot and we needed to reef. So we basically just heaved to and we reefed right away because it was just too much wind for the sail we had up. And it was uh, really pushing the boat to one side. It was really burying one of the Amas pretty good. We've been sailing pretty conservative. So that was, that was a good eye opener for us to see what it looked like when things, things change. In a, in a hurry yeah, it, was, it was classic base stuff where they had the tide going one way the wind going the other way and it, it yeah it just flipped jumped 20 20 knots of wind in, in about 100 feet and so that was that was exciting but it, with the boat the boat didn't really care it was more the squishy humans on board that were nervous <laughs> have you done much practice heaving too and mastering that skill we haven't. In fact, to be honest, it was a little bit of an accident that we hoped to that time. <laughs> we, we were trying to turn the boat around to get out of the wind and, and went too far and backwinded the back the jib. And suddenly I said, hey, we've hoped too. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the funniest thing that it was a little bit chaotic for us in the cockpit. And then suddenly everything Just calmed down and calm down. we can we can thank Lyndon Martin for showing us how that works. And it was I, I just kind of looked up because I was trying to get everything ready to reef. I looked up and said, hey, we've hove too. This is perfect. Let's take our time, figure out what the heck's going on. So <laughs> classic rookie luck. <laughs> we'll get, uh, we'll get quick, there, though. quick question yeah. for 
John Markle's on the design of the base of that rubber. Quite unusual. I suppose we might be able to talk about that. A bit. I'm afraid I couldn't hear that. There was a lot of sparking going on. The question again? I think we're interference from someone named Mark. There we go. Uh, question was about the rudder design on this particular uh, constant camber at the base of the rudder. It's quite unusual. I was wondering if you might be able to talk about that a little bit. Well, the rudder is, um, is attached to a skeg permanently, and then the skeg slides into the slot in the transom so that it all kicks up. And um, the, the idea is that you can, um, um, you can sail into shallow water, you can, um, you can repair the rudder at sea because you can take it off easily. Um, you've just got to pull the pivot bolt and, uh, and the whole thing comes up. Yeah, I was more referring to the the lateral wing that runs across the base. Oh well, that's that's not of my. Um, that's an end plate. Um, and if if uh, is that uh, David's original? Joel? Yeah, yeah, he he did that. Yeah, I okay. I wasn't sure how effective it was, but we we just left it. We reinforced it a bit actually, and then and then left it because he had such great care putting it there. We assume he thought it had a purpose. Well, yeah, the theory is that, that, that the tip of the rudder down there loses efficiency because um, pressure water on one side merely slides underneath the, the, uh, the bottom edge uh, to relieve the, the pressure. And so there's, um, there's a, a, a loss of efficiency for about the third of the, the, the length of the rudder at the bottom. The end plate is um, is just like the wingtips that they're putting on the uh, on all the airliners now, is to cut the vortices and stop that that um, water from escaping underneath the, the the rudder and improve its efficiency. It it does so at at um, with increasing a little bit of wetted surface, but it's probably worth it. It's just that the end plate itself is rather vulnerable to damage also. If you grounding, that sort of thing, um, it's, it's, a, it's a liability. But you know, if it's strong enough, it should work well. We'll, we'll see. Is that, is that a modification that'd be worthy to do to a, a sea runner? Um, the sea runner rudders have, have, are always, they're very big. And, and so one thing that there's never been a chronic problem with the sea runners because the rudders are so big, they have never uh, been at a loss for rudder authority. Um, the authority is really good with them um, at, at all points of sale. So I wouldn't bother with it. I don't think, I don't think you'd find any improvement. Even if they're overweight like mine? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're overweight, that means the rudder's even deeper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, this is certainly a beautiful boat, Joel and Patty. Um, boy, you've done a masterful job. I'm sure that David would be very pleased to, to see this if he were here. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's quite a credit to your craftsmanship and your, and your planning and everything else. I hope you have a great time with it. We just we just followed your plans, but no, I we appreciate that. Yeah, we're forever grateful to you and David and Wayne and everybody else that that led us in this direction. We we would probably be floating somewhere, but it wouldn't be on a boat this nice. Nice, so we're yeah. we're, excited, we're excited to be on it. Well, great. Well, I'm um, I'm probably going to sign off right now. Thank you for the for the for the look at the boat, the chance to have a look at it, and and uh, and hear you your uh, description and so forth. Uh, uh, it was great. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks. And I'll, I'll, I'll email you a link. The, all these pictures we showed you are, are just in an online gallery. And so I can send you a link if you ever wanted to take a look at something in more detail. OK, great. Well, enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. All right. And, and thank you, Diane, for the invite. and um, and. and uh, being able to be part of this uh, whole thing. Well, so so glad you can be here and you're always welcome anytime okay. you want to come. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Nice good night, night. Thanks for being here. Good night. All right.
Diana just wanted to ask you. Um, I'm being an interference, and I'm in a quiet room. What, what's, the, what's the issue? I wonder if it's waves lapping on your hull. Oh, it's flat calm here. What, what, what are you hearing? Um, a lot of uh, odd noises. Sounds like old timey AM or uh, yeah, AM radio interference. Mm -hmm. well, I had a, I had a uh, the radio was on low earlier, but I shut it off probably an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only other thing, I had a little circulating fan on the heater. I just turned that off. If I, is it still noise now? I think it was your fan. Okay. I can barely hear it myself. I guess it's a new machine. I, have not, I guess the microphone might be facing the wrong way or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, there, there, may be, there may still be some noise. But, but you know, in, in general, for Zoom, um, I, I prefer to mute myself unless I'm talking and... That that seems to work pretty well. So, right. yeah. Oh, I just told myself to make a comment, but then, no, and it never happens. I to ask. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to yeah. ask a question. The windage in those cockpit enclosures. I've been thinking of something myself, but it's almost like having the brakes on. You're going to windward. It might have to be about three feet above the cabin top and eight feet wide. <laughs> so, would like to ask John about that. Lost the chance. <laughs> You know, I thought about the same thing. I mean, for us, it, it definitely is very simple to up a little bit more. The feedback that's making through this machine. Yeah, the feedback is making through this machine. Maybe if you mute yourself when you're not talking, that, then we probably won't get it. Right, yes. Happened. <laughs> what is that? Well, you can always open the windows if you're getting too much uh, interference, right? <laughs> well, you got the tempered glass, you can't really get rid of that. Well, um, Mary Baker is sharing her screen. What do you want to show us? Marge, you're showing your you're on a screen. Mom, you're on our screen. Like you're sharing to everyone. <laughs> oh, is that... Mom needs help. Mom needs tech help. Is, is that David's wife? No, it's my mom. Uh, is that Patty's mom? That's yes. The original David's wife. Oh, it's the young girl's mom. Call mom at home. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're seeing her screen, huh? Yeah. She doesn't know how to stop screen, share screen. There we are. Okay. You know, for some reason, are you just able to? Yes, we're happy to answer any other questions. If not, then you probably could stop the recording just so that you don't. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Paul, do you have, you said you have a, um, uh, uh, a dodger like that, a hard dodger. Do you notice any um, effect that that has on your windward ability? Um, well, I can't tell because it's always been on the boat, um, but it, it, it's a lot uh, lower than uh, Joel and Patty's. Um, it can just sort of barely stand up under it, almost. Um, and mine is, of course, much shorter. And so it, it only overhangs the cockpit a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm using the winches. I am bent over very slightly. Theirs is, theirs is really high. Uh, but no, it doesn't. As far as I know, it, it shouldn't affect the windward ability. Um, it coming up the coast, it was just like wonderful. I mean, because I mean, it's you're getting hit by 53 degree um, um, water all the time, <laughs> and it did a really good job keeping. Does a really good job keeping the cockpit dry, even even mine, which you know stops at just uh, I think six inches past the uh, 
front of the cockpit. Um, it, it was great. I mean, I, I have a friend who um, brought a 33 foot main cat up the coast and their boat is a lot like that. It's, it's like a big sunroom. And he said that they were in shorts most of the time in shirt sleeves. Um, and that's saying a lot coming up that coast. So, so yeah, I can imagine the protection from the weather is pretty nice. Um, I'm also gonna put a um, <clears throat> solar panel on top. And it's really great for furling the main because they just hop on top and uh, uh, handle the main from that, from there it, where it's basically at sort of like knee level. Joel and Patty, we're, uh, we're looking forward. We're, we're thinking about doing a trip down through California. So hopefully we can catch up with you sometime. We'd love to go for a sale. That'd be great. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. We, we'll be around for a while. So we'd love to take you out. Good. Yeah, it'd probably be about five weeks from now. We should just be kind of getting ready to, to head south. So we should be, we should know more then than we do now. Yeah. Hey, uh, Joel and Patty, I know that uh, you, you probably put in at Napa with the trailer there, but did you have any opportunity to weigh the boat to see how much it weighed when it was all assembled? No, uh, we, we sure don't. I'm, I was going to try and just take my best guess just by where the water line is, trying to figure out the volume of water in there, because I've got a pretty relatively accurate 3D model, but I, I haven't bothered. I, I'm sure it's overweight be, just because we've got a we got too much stuff on the boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we still are sort of in construction mode. We don't probably don't need three gallons of epoxy and all the stuff we've got. But I, I think it's probably just above what John would have said was the max weight for as far as the payload goes. Just because we put full wings. I mean, just the building those big decks that probably added 300, 300 pounds, maybe 500 pounds with all the glass and fiberglass and paint and, and all that, just the sheets of plywood. And then the full cockpit enclosure with real glass and nice countertops in the boat. So it, it just all adds up at 20, 30 pounds a piece. So I, I think it's supposed to be like 7,200 pounds was supposed to be the total weight with full payload. And I'm, or I would be surprised if we're you know, 7,500 closer to 8,000 even maybe. It, it, it would be nice to know, but I, I really don't. Hey, hey, Paul, have you ever weighed your boat? Well, I take it out of Port Townsend. It's a 300 ton travel lift and their um, weight gauge uh, won't, uh, won't cover anything that light, <laughs> put it that way. Um, it is, um, I believe it is a lot lighter than the normal, the regular design because Dick um, has a lot of carbon fiber uh, foam core in there, which I think he, I'm sure he snitched from um, uh, scaled composites. Um, and the cabin soles for one thing are, are, are that. And the deck between the AMA and the main hull is um, also foam core uh, carbon fiber. Um, <clears throat> so it's, and actually, uh, he told me that John told him that he, on the cabin soles alone, he saved 200 pounds um, using that stuff. And I've discovered that actually one of the decks of the Amas is, uh, uh, has carbon in it too. Um, plus I've only got, my engine is a 9.9 um, high thrust. So that's 125 pounds versus the inboard, which is between two and 300, I think. So it's, it's, it's a lot lighter than the original design. It all adds up. Mm -hmm. um, Joel and Patty, are you, gonna, are you planning on doing a Coast Guard documentation on this boat? Yeah, that, that's exactly what we did. It's, it's Coast Guard documented. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that process, if no one else is gonna be? Um, yeah. Patty has a different version than me because she doesn't like bureaucracy, but it was actually well, pretty it, straight. It was pretty straightforward that the biggest, the only real challenge we had is we were missing. There was a little bit of information we were missing and they said that they sent documents that we never received. In, hmm. in so that drug out the process longer than it should have. Although 
to their credit, there was a phone number that I could call and talk to a human and she was super helpful. So once we got the missing information put into the documents, then the process was pretty straightforward. I mean, it ended up taking what's four or six months, but that was no. mostly on our side. Well, yeah, Joel doesn't have quite that quite right, but um, we got, we, I started the process in March and we didn't get the documentation until late August. So it took about six months. Yeah. It probably would have taken four if we would have. Well, right there, the the, I would say navigating their site is a little bit um, difficult because they don't give you all the information you really need on how to go about, you know, doing all the information that they needed. So that was difficult. Um, so it took us several tries to get everything that they needed in order for them to process everything and finally get it, get it right. One of the things they don't tell you is that you actually have to make up your own hull number if it's a brand new boat. <laughs> Based on certain criteria, like there's certain criteria of like how you make that up. But yeah, that's all that's all stuff you have to do. And that nowhere in their documentation does it say anything about that. But the good news is that once we had it, I mean, then now you can actually pay for five years. I think it's five years worth of it, you know, for it's only like fifty or sixty dollars a year or something, but it's it simplifies things moving forward, that that's for sure. Yeah. So we're documented now for a five year stint. The renewal nice. process is really fast. Uh once once you send it yeah. in, you get it back really quick. Yeah, um, that shouldn't be so much of a problem going forward, but just trying to document it as a brand new boat and everything, there was a lot more to it than just like reallocating, you know, a hull that had already been documented and or, you know, been through the process. So, yeah, that, so that was interesting. <laughs> what hull number did you wind up with? Pardon me? What hull number did you uh, wind up with? It's a long sequence of letters and numbers and um, base. I can tell you. there's actually a, a certain sequence for home built boats and it's, it's, it was, well, it's kind of like a VIN number. It's exactly what it is. So yeah. we have a we have an official number which is one three zero two six seven six, but then our hall um, our actual hall number or whatever is. Um, W N Z, which is for Washington. Why there's a Z and an N and Z in there, I don't know, but this is their criteria. W N Z 35, which is for the 35 foot, 0, 11, which is the uh, 11 is for the boat. Yeah. It would be 11, yeah, the 11th, the 11th boat. boat, right? And then um, F, what was that for? F 0. After that, we had to do with the date. That, that oh, yeah. Going. So I think February, I think it was. F is for February. And then uh, the year built 2020, because that's basically when it was finished. So, so there was logic to it. You can, you can sort of make up some of the stuff in the middle. <laughs> so you have a Washington registration? Um, you have a Washington registration? and just We, we don't. Oh, okay. uh, you mean on the boat hull? No, yeah. Yeah. Well, it registered is registered as a Washington boat because it was started in Washington State. Okay, that's good. Just don't let California know you're there. Yeah. Well, they already do. Unfortunately, they're already trying to hunt us down for some taxes. <laughs> yeah, it's called the equal. I think it's called the equal. The Department of Equalization. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so yeah, so, um, and then of course, you know, being from Edmonds, Washington, so that's that's the other reason why we wanted to make sure that it was kind of registered as a Washington state boat. Not only was the hall started there, but we um, are also from Washington state. So we also wanted to make sure that it sort of started and, and finished. finished there in some manner, <laughs> yeah. registering it, so. Yeah, so anyways, yeah, it's an interesting process if you're trying to document a new, brand new boat build. Melissa, I've been trying to get a hold of your mother. Could you have her call me? Yes, I've lost I her. I don't have her phone number anymore. Oh, 
I'll put it in the chat to you. And she has, well, and she has mine, but thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel and Patty, yeah, I ju just ordered um, this week a brand new Pelagic autopilot. So I was glad to hear that you've been testing it out. Yeah. It's working really well for us. Yeah, it, it's, it seems super robust. It's, it's nice to have separate control units from the head and all those things. And so, and we bought, I don't know if you bought, but we bought the little remote control for it, which is handy. It, it, I did. It, she pitched me for a second remote. So when I lost the first one overboard, I, I got a backup one and she, she says, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it in for 30 bucks. I said, okay. Why not? Yeah, why not? We've got Great. two, I think. I think we get two, right? Oh, I thought we had two. Anyway. Well, go ahead, hit her up, you know, tell her I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it seems like a super solid unit. Yeah. yeah like a very well, my troubles with my Ray Marine unit, I've had Navico autopilots, I've had various ones, and they're much less expensive and they seem more robust and a little better design. I understand the electronics are actually built here in Seattle, hmm. uh, the electronics part, and everybody gets their RAMs from other places. Um, I feel for you dealing with the state of California on taxes. I've, been, I've done that and it's terrible. And yeah, you need to have Washington registration. You can you can work with them a lot easier. Yeah, as, as getting and then tell tell them you're a visitor there. And that's that's a hassle. I've done I've been there too. In fact, I'm still stuck in a California well, tax right the, the now. The thing that makes it kind of even more like a you know stick it to them kind of thing is that we were you know staying at the marina. We were playing you know, live aboard at plus a rent, uh, rental space, you know, on in the yard. So I feel like the state is double dipping a lot because they're trying to collect more money from us personally when we were already, you know, the, the marina has to pay their taxes and whatnot on the property, which we were already paying a rent for on top of being live aboards. So it wasn't like we were not paying our dues. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of like, and so we the state of California, they think that's a compliment, you know. Oh, really? They're double dipping, that's exactly what we want to do. <laughs> yeah. They're so. just incorrigible to deal with. But anyway, um, the um for the other people that are I've I've documented a couple, I don't know, three vessels, I suppose. If you have a production boat like an F-27, yeah, much easier process yeah. because all these things you're talking about are already come with the boat. You put it right through, it's fine. Exactly. I, my boat that I own now was a one-off and the prior owner had quite an adventure uh, documenting that as a, as a one-off production boat. I bet. Uh, and there's a funny uh, number assigned and some things like that. So I think everybody goes through that when you have a, a, a one of a kind um, custom built boat, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it's gotten worse. <laughs> yeah, I got, it got real worse for me. My boat was built in Indiana, which not a lot of boats were built there. And then Washington said I had a non-conforming HIN number, the whole identification number. So they updated it and they saw that it was a sea runner. So they, they gave me the sea runner by Hughes craft, which is a really, really expensive fishing boat. <laughs> tune of about you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the base price, and then my insurance told me they were going to drop me because I only had my two hundred fifty thousand dollar fishing boat insured for twenty grand. Yeah. So then I had to go back and change the number for a third time. So I got all these little metal plaques on the, my transom now from all the different numbers. I feel like they're like little trophy years of the trophy <laughs> era or something. <laughs> I had to um, prove to California that um, I had Washington registration because when the boat was sold, the, um, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, of course, told them. And um, so once I, I got that down, they, they stopped bothering me. And fortunately, they never found out that I was in Fort Bragg for two years. Uh, if, if they had known that, they would have uh, hit me with, uh, for their uh, property tax Right there, right there. Hey, I was I was uh, curious about Anne Marie. 
do you or your sisters live in Washington or are you somewhere else? So I am still in Washington. I, we live in Lake Stevens, mm -hmm. but my sister, I'm not sure. I know she was going to drop off pretty soon. Um, my sister and um, both of my sisters and my stepmother are in Massachusetts. Ah, okay. I just uh, wondered if you will ever have a chance to go see the boat. You know, I'm sure it would, you know, obviously you've got great memories of it and even the show, right? today has been wonderful for you but uh, I'll bet I'll bet you'd be interested to see it sometime I'm sure oh I absolutely would be I would love to be able to see it sometime yeah maybe you can fly down to Mexico and spend a couple of weeks with them <laughs> <laughs> we would love to have you come and we'd love to take you sailing so yeah thank you yeah so Joel how well does that pelagic tack the boat we actually haven't tried that. We were just talking about that, but we haven't actually used that function yet. Well, next time we go out, we'll have to do it because we just we just haven't. I think just because we've been trying to figure out how to tack the boat ourselves. But I really I we were just happened to look at the instructions. Like, oh yeah, we can hold the button for three seconds and it'll tack it for us. So we'll, we'll give that a try the next time we go out. Yeah, because my Ray, my Ray Marine is, can be a little problem with that. If it's if it stalls, um, it will actually stop. And I have to um, uh, push the button to take it offline and then get the boat straightened out and, and um, put it back online. But when it, if, it, if it works right, it works, it works okay. I mean, it throws it over really fast um, and uh, get going and that's fine. But if, it, if the whole, if it stalls, it, 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 it will not hold uh, the rudder if it has to hold the rudder in a, in the uh, uh, over position for a certain period of time, it just stops there. Uh, it doesn't return, um, so that that can be a problem. I'm motivated because it, it seems a real nuisance for me to have to put my beard down while Patty's tacking the boat. So, <laughs> yeah, I have this. Does it have wind in, input? How does it know the wind angles? It, it that it, that's what I'm. 90 degrees. Pardon me? As it's, as it's set up in the stock configuration, it just turns the boat 90 degrees. Oh, okay. I'm trying to come up with a, uh, and I've been talking to Pelagic about that, what kind of a wind instrument I can uh, buy without spending a thousand dollars Ray Marine that will steer the boat to the wind rather than steer it to a course. It, and it is it is set up for that, the NEMA 0183. I think I haven't actually wired it yet, but it's something I need to do before we head off just to see if we can make it real to the wind. That, that would be pretty cool. The um, One of the things I noticed on the less expensive wind instruments is the update rate is, it doesn't update fast enough. And the, um, stuff from either Simrad or Navico or any of the, they, they operate, they update maybe 10 times a second or more. And I noticed that there's another uh, less expensive alternative from a company called NASA, like the space people, NASA Marine. And that one does update, you know, 10, 20 times a second. I, I, I understand that's an issue if it doesn't update fast enough for your wind. Um, I don't know why it's an issue. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, it's been, uh, we've had some challenges um, out in the bay as sailing. It's pretty challenging sailing out here, um, especially during the kind of winter spring. It's been pretty sporadic as far as wind and just current and you know, tides and everything. So it's been challenging, um, but good because I've heard that once you kind of know how to sail out here in the bay, that you should be able to sail just about anywhere. So that's good. Just like they say up in the Northwest a lot of times too. If you can sail around the Puget Sound and around all the islands and you know deal with all the tides and all that, that you can pretty much sail just about anywhere. So, yeah. Once, once it gets hot there, you're, you'll get the high winds like around June. Yeah. And then you'll also get it pretty much steady northwest winds, which will take you down the coast. Yeah. Uh, 
June, July, it will start to howl. Hmm. Yeah, well, we're hoping to get kind of down further south before it gets too too crazy. Yeah. But um, also, Diane, I just wanted to mention that we could also put, Joel has a good Excel spreadsheet also for anybody that's interested of all of the specs and everything for the boat that we could also post uh, or put in with the, uh, the presentation. Oh, that would be great. Mark can put that on the website. Okay. Uh, is it PDF or what form is it in? Excel. It's Excel. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. that sounds great. It'll, yeah, it'll thanks. Just, it'll just be a link or just a web link to our Oh yeah. You know. Oh, oh, okay. Just a web a web link is easy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, do you, do you guys want to put a web link uh, in chat to any of your um your pictures? Yeah, I'll see if I can do that while we're still talking. I'll I just okay. have to get the URL okay. for it. And um, I I can stop recording anytime you want. Uh, it seemed like we were still sort of on topic, uh, asking about your boat. But at any point, we can. Yeah, you know. I think we kind of covered most of it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, should I uh, stop recording now then? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>